Fantastic. You can be seated. It's great to see you this morning. We welcome you so much to Edge Church. And today we are continuing our series. We began a few weeks ago, actually just last week, called Overcomer. Overcomer. And God wants us to overcome our fears and our anxieties. Well, anxiety is the number one emotional problem of our day. And psychologists tell us that panic anxiety is the number one mental health problem for women, and it is the second problem for men behind substance abuse. Many anxious people suffer from other emotional problems like depression. And uh, it's amazing how much anxiety and depression go together, kind of like peanut butter and jelly. We got to deal with this problem of anxiety. And it's no coincidence that the Bible speaks repeatedly about how to overcome fear. In fact, the number one command in Scripture is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And it's with that in mind that Peter, the apostle, begins to pin these words of the book that carries his name, 1 Peter. Peter was one of the 12. He spent so much time with Jesus, three years uh, in particular, and three years with Jesus. And as a result of that, he had a lot of insight from Jesus about how to overcome fear. Jesus faced some tough situations, didn't he? And Peter, reflecting on his experience with Jesus, begins to write the words of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, I want us to look at in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. But before we read the scripture, I want to ask you a question today. What freaks you out? What keeps you up late at night? What are you worried about in the morning? What are you thinking about when you go to bed at night? What are you thinking about all through the day? What anxieties or fears are you facing? And Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that, he may be, uh, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone that he can devour. And I want us to see three things today that are going to help us be overcomers People who overcome anxiety, fear, and worry. Would that be a good thing to talk about today? Let's see what God's word has to say to us. Beginning in verse 8, he says, first of all, stay alert because the devil attacks. Stay alert because the devil attacks. Look at it there again in verse 8. Be sober-minded. Be, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for whom anyone he can devour. Uh, this summer, uh, a wildlife park in South Africa, the Kruger National Park, they had 14 lions escape the national park. Can you just imagine what that would be like as you were in your neighborhood knowing that the lions at the at the refuge next door had escaped. You would be a little more vigilant. You, you'd be looking over your shoulder a little bit more, would you not? If lions were prowling around the neighborhood, you'd be watching your kids a little closer. You'd be watching yourself a little closer. And luckily they were able to recover the lions, but uh, the devil is described in so many different ways in the Bible. He's called an angel of light because he's a deceiver. He's called the liar. He's called the serpent. In 1 Peter, he's the roaring lion. He's one seeking whom he can devour. We have an enemy. And did you know that one of the greatest ways that the enemy works against us is through fear, anxiety, and worry? Because if the devil can get you to have fear, anxiety, and worry, you will never fulfill the purposes and the plans of God that he has for your life. And so if we're going to overcome anxiety, we have to understand we have a true enemy, a sinister, nasty foe. And his name is the devil. He's seeking whom he can devour. So he says here we should be sober-minded. Sober-minded. Sober-minded means that we just need to be aware. Like, 
there, there are usually two camps when we talk about the devil. Some people don't ever think about their, the spiritual world at all. People think that everything in the world is just what we see. And there's, nothing, there's not angels, there's not demons, there's not God, there's not, there's not the devil. It's just everything is what we see with our own eyes. That's one extreme. Another extreme is people that think the devil is like everywhere, you know? They messed up my latte at Starbucks. It must have been the devil. I got a flat tire on the way to work this morning. Must have been some demons. No, maybe you just ran over a nail. I don't know, you know? Uh, I flunked my test. Well, maybe you didn't study. You know, I don't know. <laughs> so we shouldn't discount the devil, but we also should not obsess about the devil and and, and think that every bad thing that happens in our life is because of the devil. We need to be sober-minded, he says here. Be sober-minded. And, and part of being sober-minded is recognizing that we have an adversary. Notice he says in verse 8, your adversary. In other words, he's your enemy. He wants you to be miserable. He wants to come after you. Uh, we should respect him. But we should also resist him. Now, when I say respect him, I don't mean you have to, I hope you don't like the devil. But we ought to understand that he is powerful. He does have influence. He is a legitimate foe. God is greater than the devil. Jesus has defeated the devil. But the devil is always trying to do what he can do to mess up and to throw a wrench in the plans and purposes of God. So we ought to respect him, but we also can resist him. And in James 4, 7, it says that if we'll resist the devil, he'll flee from us. So how do we overcome fear and anxiety? Number one, we have an enemy. We have an enemy. And his name is the devil. And we ought to stay alert because he's always attacking. He's attacking. We also ought to stay hopeful because God cares. And this is what he says in verse 7. He says, look with me if you would. Cast all your cares on him because he cares about you. I mean, did you know that God cares for you? God is thinking about you. You matter to God. God really does care. God cares when you get a bad report from the doctor. God cares when you don't have enough money to pay your bills that month. God cares when you're confused and afraid. God cares when you're going through a breakup. God cares when your marriage is struggling. God cares when you're going through the bankruptcy or when you're being bullied at school or when you're in the middle of a lawsuit or you didn't get the job that you wanted or you can't pay your mortgage. God cares. I mean, God really cares about you. How do we walk in victory? How are we overcomers? We got to understand God really does care. God cares for you. God cares. He really does. He cared for you when you were knit together in your mother's womb. He, he cared for you at the beginning of creation. The Bible even says that God cared for you even before the foundations of the world. God knew that you would be created. He knew your name. He knew everything about you. God cares. God cared when he sent his only son to be born into the world. God cared when, 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 when he sent Jesus to, to, to later be arrested and, and to be crucified. God cared. God cared when Jesus was, was resurrected from the grave and overcame the power of sin and death. God cared. And God cares for you today. God cares so much. And he cares so much that he sent his son. Uh, he, he cares so much when we're discouraged. He cares so much when we're confused. He cares so much when we are overwhelmed. And uh, you can't understand the ministry of Jesus if you don't understand his compassion. Now, Jesus, reflecting the heart of God, in Matthew 9, 36, the Bible says, When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus cares. Jesus cares. He cared for the people. Uh, Jesus cared for the group. He cared for the individual. Look in Mark chapter 1. Uh, verse 41, moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. 
This was to a man with, who had leprosy. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Why did Jesus heal the man with leprosy? Jesus cared. Jesus cared. He was moved with great compassion. And in Romans chapter 8, the scriptures tell us that Jesus is even at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. Now, does it get much better than that? The love of Jesus did not end when he ascended into heaven. The, the love and the compassion of Christ continues today. And he's interceding for you. God cares. God cares. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. The reason you can cast your cares is because God cares. Because God cares. Uh, Jesus met big needs and little needs. Big needs and little needs. Some, have you ever thought, well, I don't want to bring this need to the Lord in prayer because it's a small need. Have you ever thought, this is too small to pray about. It concerns me, but I don't want to bother God. I've never said to my kids, don't bring me your small problems. When my kids want to talk about just the smallest, the smallest problem, I want to hear all about it. Let's talk about it. I care. I care. Big problems, little problems, let's talk about it. I think the Heavenly Father is the same. He wants to know about the big cares and the little cares. And that's why he says, cast all your cares on, on me. Cast all of them. Throw all of them on the Lord. Now, Simon Peter had seen, had seen Jesus meeting his needs. He knew Jesus cared. I mean, in, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus is kind of introducing himself to Simon Peter and Peter's kind of testing Jesus out and, and, and he goes out into the Sea of Galilee and Jesus says, throw your nets overboard and he catches so many fish that the boat begins to sink. <laughs> and Peter was a fisherman and Jesus knew that Peter needed a business breakthrough. <laughs> he had so many fish he had to bring in all of his buddies to bring in the catch. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Some of you need a business breakthrough. Jesus cares. Jesus cares. Uh, Jesus cares about our finances. Uh, Peter was worried he wasn't going to be able to pay his taxes. And in Matthew 17, Jesus said, go fishing. And the first fish that you catch, there's going to be a coin in his mouth. Take the coin out and pay the taxes. How about that for fishing? <laughs> and he does. And there's financial provision. Jesus cares. Uh, Peter needed a miracle. That's why he began to walk on the water with Jesus. Some of you need a miracle. You need a miracle. Uh, some of us need help getting through a mistake we've made. Well, that's Simon Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. They're arresting Jesus. Peter draws a sword and cuts the ear off of one of the Roman guards. I don't think he was aiming for his ear. But he cut the ear off. What did Jesus do? He put, picked up the ear and he healed the man. Has Jesus ever fixed something that you screwed up? <laughs> He's in the business of doing that. He cares. Jesus cares. He cares. That's why he's such a wonderful Savior. He cares about our past. He cares about our present. He cares about our future. And because he cares, we ought to stay prayerful because God listens. We ought to stay prayerful. Now, he says here, cast all your cares on me. Or another translation says, God cares for you, so turn all your worries over to him. How many would love it if you could take everything you were worried about, you could hand that to God, and you could walk out the door and never carry the weight of that burden again? Would that be great? That's what he's talking about right here. Uh, another translation, the good news translation says, leave all your worries with him because he cares for you. I'm going to leave that with you, God. Good luck. You know, I'm out of here. Another translation says, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. When I think about casting, a lot of times I think about fishing. Do we have any fisher fishermen? Anybody love to fish here? Some people? Nobody likes to fish. Okay. 
I used to fish as a kid. And you cast the line, and then what do you do? Yeah, you reel it back in. Somebody said, wait for the fish. Yeah, that's good. All right, you're more spiritual than me. Yeah. <laughs> you cast it, and then you got to reel it back in. You know, have you ever prayed about something one night and woke up in the morning just as worried about it as you were before you prayed about it? You casted it, and then you reeled it back in. That's not what God wants us to do. When we cast our cares on the Lord, God wants us to leave that with him. We don't cast it and then take it back. Cast it and then take it back. We throw it in such a way as if we're never going to see it again. In fact, another translation says, throw all your worries on the Lord. Throw those worries on God. God, here you go. I'm going to throw those on you. I don't want them back. 1 Peter 5, 7 says in the um, ISB, throw all your worries on him because he cares for you. Well, how do I cast my cares on the Lord? I mean, how do I throw my burdens on the Lord? Because most of us would say that sounds like a really good idea. I think the Apostle Paul had that in mind in Philippians 4 when he said, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We cast through prayer. And I love this part here, this latter part here in verse 7 where he says, And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, when you actually cast and you give and you throw your worries on the Lord, then you begin to have peace because you're not carrying the weight of all of that responsibility by yourself. That's called peace. And it's a peace that passes all understanding. I mean, it's so hard to even articulate it. It's hard to explain it. It's hard to put it into words. If you've ever experienced this peace, you know what I'm talking about. But it's hard to describe because it passes all understanding. <laughs> Human intuition has a hard time explaining it. But it's great peace. It's that peace that passes all understanding. So we cast it in prayer. See, when we don't cast our worries on the Lord, we have to try to find other coping methods that leads us to a dead end road. You know the reason that a lot of people abuse drugs? They're trying to escape from anxiety, worry, and fear. I've talked to many people that are drug addicts, and, and it started, it started with, I was so freaked out I didn't know what to do, so I started using drugs. Well, now you got two problems. I started drinking too much because I, I was trying to cope. I didn't know what to do. What if our coping method was to give things to God rather than creating other problems for our lives? How much better would our lives be? It'd be a lot better. Why, why do people not cast their cares on the Lord? One is pride. If you look at 1 Peter 5, 6, he says, Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him. See, Verse 6 and verse 7 are actually one sentence. They're actually one flow of thought. If you're humble, then giving your worries to God seems natural. If you're prideful, you think, my solutions are better than God's. Why would I give God my problems? I think I can handle it all myself. I got this all under control. I was talking with somebody this week who said, I hate going to church. And, you know, as a pastor, I'm always interested. Why, why, would you, why do you hate going to church? Tell me. Is it really that bad? You know, I mean, talk to me. He said, I hate going to church because God speaks to me about all the changes I need to make in my life. And I know that he's right, but I don't want to make any changes. I was like, well, I appreciate your honesty. That's good. I said, hey, just, just food for thought. Have you ever considered making some changes in your life? Like it may not be that bad. Whatever it is that God's telling you to do, what if, just what if, that was the choice you should make? 
And he said, I don't want to make those changes. I think my friend is a, is a lot like a lot of other people. A lot of times we think we know better. Or we would rather be miserable trying to do it our own way. <laughs> but as long as pride is in the driver's seat of our life, casting our cares will never be part of our existence. So pride, pride. In our heart, we believe we have better ideas than God. All that Ten Commandments stuff, all that Sermon on the Mount stuff, I'm the one exception. I know better than the Lord. I'm the, I'm the footnote. <laughs> I got better ideas. A second reason is we just maybe have such a habit of worry and anxiety, that's all we've ever known. I mean, maybe worry and anxiety has just always been the pattern of your life. Maybe you saw it in the home, and that's the way you grew up, and and just your whole life when when problems happen, worry, worry, anxiety, anxiety, worry, fear, worry, anxiety. And that's a nasty habit to break, is it not? It's a hard habit to break. Woo! Woo! Nobody will say being anxious is good, but getting rid of anxiety, whoo, that's tough. That's tough. He says, cast all your cares on me. Start a new pattern for your life. What would it be like today if you made the decision, I'm not going to live under the weight of anxiety anymore. I'm leaving that with God. I'm not going back. I'm setting a new precedence, a new pattern for my life. My family's going to be different. I'm moving a new direction. I'm not going to do what I have always done before. Cast all your cares on him. Cast all of them. You know, uh, our church is celebrating our 10-year anniversary in two weeks. Is that incredible or what? 10 years. 10 years. Come on. 10 years. And so I've been thinking about this a lot because 10 years is, is a long time. You only get to celebrate a 10-year anniversary one time, I think. Is that right? Once? It's a pretty big deal. 10 years. 10 years. It's been, it's been great. I'm telling you, some amazing things. We've thrown some Hail Mary passes here at Edge Church, and some great things have happened. But i got to be honest with you, there's been some other times where things have been very difficult and very hard. It's not easy. It's not easy. There's been some times where I've had a lot of fear and anxiety. I'm preaching out of my own own experience here today. And it's tough. But I'll tell you, Gina and I are more convinced today than we ever have been before that the only way to walk in victory over fear, anxiety, and worry is to take our burdens and to give those to the Lord. The small ones... The big ones, the medium-sized ones, that is the only way to keep going. And I believe that we're here today because we have continued to give God the burdens that were too heavy for us to carry. And I think the same is true in our own lives. If we want to excel, if we want to succeed, if we want to fulfill the purposes and the plans and the destiny that God has for our life, we have to cast those cares on him. God did not make you to carry your own burdens. Did you know that? It's too heavy. So so quit trying. Stop trying. God, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to give it over to you. Well, my quarterback experience began in the fifth grade. In the fifth grade, I joined a football team and the coach said, Ryan, you're going to be our wing back, but I need you to be the backup quarterback. And I was like, all right, coach, whenever you need the backup quarterback to go in, I'll play quarterback. I never really wanted to play quarterback, but we had a quarterback, our starting quarterback cried a lot, and he was always getting hurt in the fifth grade. And our team won one game in the fifth and sixth grade. We, we actually lost all games in fifth grade. I think we won one in sixth grade. So in two seasons, we won one game. We didn't have a very good football team. And I learned why our quarterback was crying all the time. 
was because he had a big red X all over his chest. We had no offensive line. We had no blocking. We had nobody to run the ball. We had, we had, we had no plays. We had no plan. We had no nothing. And so when quarterback Ethan would cry, coach would put me in. And then I would think about crying. You know, it was, it was bad. I learned the worst place to ever be on the football field is the quarterback of the opposing team that has no game. Because the defense is coming for you. There's nobody else to worry about. So I perfected the fastest handoffs known to man. I could take the ball and give it to the running back, and I remember a few times even pointing. He's got the ball. Because there were guys as big as my dad that were laying on top of me, and it was not pleasant. If it was a pass play, I would take the snap, and I would throw the ball. And I didn't even care if there was a wide receiver that was running down the field. It was just, I'm going to get rid of it quickly. Just get rid of it, man. They're coming for you. They say that a great NFL quarterback can throw the ball 70 to 80 yards. Can you believe that? Like in practice, 70 to 80 yards. And up to 70 miles an hour. It's pretty incredible. In the NFL, if you're a running quarterback, you don't make it. It's too much of a financial investment, and guys get hurt too much. So if you're a drop-back passer, you got an opportunity maybe in the NFL. If you're a runner, forget it. High school, maybe college if you're lucky. If you run too much, they cut you. I was thinking about this word, throw, cast, all your cares on the Lord. And that's not a fishing line because a fishing line we reel back in. That's a quarterback. Quarterbacks are in the business of throwing. And they are throwing far and as far and with high intensity as they can. God wants us to throw like an NFL quarterback. Did you know this? God wants to be your wide receiver. God wants to catch the ball, and if the defense runs after him, well, then good luck. We should be throwing that football. We should be throwing those problems wherever we go. When we begin to be anxious about the future and about the things that are before us, we should be casting. We should be casting. We should be throwing. We should be throwing our cares on the Lord. Don't you throw that back at me. I gave that to you. I don't want that back. <laughs> Somebody else throw in there. When we have problems with fear and anxiety, when we're trying to figure out how to pay, pay the bills and we don't know what to do, let's take that problem and let's throw that thing on the Lord. Let's throw it on the Lord. I don't want that back. And you know what? As we begin to take our fears and anxieties and to give those to the Lord, then what begins to happen? We begin to have peace. We begin to have calm. We begin to focus. We begin to have energy again. We begin to have joy in our life. We begin to have strength and vitality. And we begin to fulfill everything that God has called us to do. Instead of trying to run with the ball and to solve our own problems, what would it be like if we begin to pass those problems over to God? Let's bow together for a word of prayer.